Thanks again. <coughs> there were some interesting questions about the colloquium during the break, but uh, I'm not going to mix it up uh, with these lectures. Uh, maybe I can explain them uh, sometime later. So uh, I'll have three lectures. Uh, one, the first one, is about phase transitions beyond the Ginsburg-Landau paradigm. Now, I talked to Silvio Pufo, and he told me he didn't actually explain what is the Ginsburg Landau paradigm. So I'll just like, take five minutes to explain what it means. You know what it means. I'm just going to introduce this terminology, uh, which is very common, actually, in some fields of research to use this terminology. So I'll, I'll explain what this terminology means. And then I'll uh, present the simplest construction, which is uh, beyond the Ginsburg Landau paradigm. Uh, and I'll, you'll see that it's, it's a very rich and interesting system, which can be thought of as a lattice system and a continuum quantum field theory. And it has these discrete anomalies that I mentioned. Uh, so it's a very, very rich system. But let me first start by explaining what is the beyond Ginsburg-Landau paradigm. Uh, and then these two topics are uh, what I'm going to talk about tomorrow and on Friday. So I'll start by explaining what is the Ginsburg-Landau paradigm. Uh, and again, uh, as we always do, I'll just appeal to the Ising model. So in the Ising model, we have uh, spins, which are either 0 or 1. Let's say spins which are either minus 1 or 1, uh, located at each side. These are classical variables. We just sum over all the possible configurations. And we sum over all the, all the nearby uh, pairs of spins. And we can put a coefficient here, which is positive, such that the spins favor being uh, aligned in the same direction. And now, uh, these kind of systems, these are classical systems. So for example, here I drew two dimensions. So if the systems have a continuum limit, it would be a one it would be a two-dimensional QFT. So it may become a 2D QFT. And the transitions here are as a function of the temperature. So we, put a, we just introduce a Boltzmann factor, as usual, e to the minus HT. And we sum over all the configurations, right? I, I am, I'm doing it very, in a very sketchy way because I assume that you already know all this stuff. So we sum over all the configurations. And there may be a transition as a function of T. And this transition may be described by a two-dimensional continuum quantum field theory. And the statement uh, that these are uh, transitions of the Ginsburg-Landau type mean the following. These transitions are usually accompanied, accompanied by an order parameter getting a VEV, a vacuum expectation value. So in the Ginsburg-Landau uh, description of the Ising model, it would be the magnetization, which near the transition becomes a local, a local operator in the QFT, M of x. And on one side of the transition, it has a vacuum expectation value. And on the other side of the transition, it does not. And the Landau Ginsburg or Ginsburg Landau framework is that we can describe the transition by fluctuations of the order parameter. That's the, that's the claim to fame. So the fluctuations of the order parameter is what we call the Ginsburg Landau framework. It's synonymous. What it means in practice is that we can describe the conformal field theory that appears at this transition by a Lagrangian for the order parameter. Right? And this Lagrangian has the standard terms that everybody knows, a kinetic term, a mass term, and a quartic term, and possibly higher terms, which are usually argued to be irrelevant by Wilson's universality ideas. So we usually don't discuss them by Wilson's universality. So Phase transitions, classical or quantum zero temperature or finite temperature that can be described by fluctuations of the order parameter are called Ginsburg-Landau-like phase transitions. And they are described by these CFTs like Ising, ON models, Wilson-Fisher fixed points. So maybe all of the examples that you have so far discussed in this school are of this type. Maybe somebody can correct me, but as far as I know, the examples you have so far discussed are of this type. So for example, all the ON models with cubic in, hypercubic interactions, ordinary interactions, whatever, these are all within this framework. All the minimal models in two dimensions are of this sort. 
So all these models are, in some very vague sense, boring, because they're in the Ginzburg-Landau framework. And OK, these are fluctuations of the order parameters. We've seen that. We've done that. Now I want to tell you about uh, that there is some stuff beyond Ginzburg-Landau. There are some interesting phase transitions, which are beyond the Ginzburg-Landau framework. So let me explain the idea behind these transitions and uh, why we say that they are beyond Ginzburg-Landau. And we actually can prove that. So we can sometimes prove that it cannot be described by a, fluctu by a Lagrangian for the fluctuating order parameter. So first, I'll start with the idea. This is a rather rough idea. It's not very precise, but it's uh, useful nevertheless. So these ON models, minimal models, uh, Ising-like models, Wilson Fisher models, they often arise from a classical system of spins, a classical system of spins with some interactions. And then you tune the temperature in your Boltzmann uh, sum, and you hit the phase transition, where the correlation lens blows up. And below this critical temperature, you expect that some symmetries will be broken. These are the symmetries that are uh, described by the order parameter. So typically, for things within the Ginzburg-Landau framework, you would expect that below the critical temperature, some symmetries G will be broken to some subgroup H. Perhaps the subgroup is trivial. And above this uh, temperature, or let's say much, much above this temperature, you expect all the symmetries to be restored. This is the typical prediction of all the models within the Ginzburg-Landau framework. Low temperatures, symmetry breaking. High temperatures, disordered phase. This is called the disordered phase. This is another piece of terminology that I'll be using. A disordered phase means a unique trivial vacuum. That's what it means technically. Unique, non-degenerate, sorry, this is redundant. Uh, unique trivial vacuum, non-degenerate trivial vacuum. What the word trivial means is that it doesn't support, let's say, topological excitations. That's what, that's what it means, technically. So that's the general framework of Ginzburg and Landau. High temperatures, the symmetries are restored. Low temperatures, the symmetries are not restored. Now, of course, these uh, kind of Lagrangians, they are good for both classical phase transitions as a function of the temperature, but they can also describe quantum phase transitions. So we can also use this kind of Lagrangians for order parameters to describe zero temperature transitions where you have a quantum Hamiltonian and the transition is driven by quantum fluctuations rather than thermal fluctuations. So we can use such Lagrangians to describe quantum phase transitions where by quantum phase transitions, I mean that we're no longer discussing, cla discussing classical physics. We're describing, we have a quantum Hamiltonian H, quantum phase transitions. We have a quantum Hamiltonian H, and it has a bunch of parameters. Let's say G is one coupling constant. And we can change the parameter G. And the nature of the quantum ground state changes. So a typical picture is that here is G. And here, there is some special G. And this is at zero temperature. We're just discussing ground states of quantum Hamiltonians. So the temperature is now identically zero, unlike the other scenario. And a quantum phase transition would mean that there is one phase here, some phase here, and another phase here. And in the middle, there, this Hamiltonian could be massless, for example. There could be gapless excitations. So here, there may be gapless excitations. And and this, at this point, G star, you would have a conformal field theory. So one has to distinguish quantum phase transitions, which are achieved by dialing the temperature from quantum phase transitions, which are achieved at zero temperature by varying the coupling constants in some Hamiltonian. And then there may be a special uh, choice for these couplings, where you have gapless excitations, a massless ground state. And on the other sides of the transition, the ground state could be simpler. It could be just uh, some phase where some symmetry is spontaneously broken. But here, you might encounter a non-trivial conformal field theory. So this could lead to a non-trivial CFT. Now, oftentimes, these transitions cannot be viewed as just Lagrangians for the order parameter, for some order parameter. Because typical Lagrangians for order parameters, like this 
family of Lagrangians, they always have disordered phases. If you add a huge mass, huge positive mass to all the scalar fields M, you'd always have a, disor a disordered phase. But in many quantum phase transitions, this is non-trivial and this is non-trivial. So today we'll discuss a system in which the symmetry is SO3 times Z4. That's the first example of this phenomenon, where on this side of the transition, SO3 is broken, and on this side of the transition, the Z4 is broken. And in the middle, there might be a CFT, a gapless, a gapless state. And so one can ever try, one can ever produce this kind of behavior with order parameters. Because with your, when you write a Lagrangian for order parameters, there would always be a disordered phase. And here one can prove, and we'll prove that, that there cannot be a disordered phase. It's not like people weren't smart enough and there is actually a disordered phase, no. There is no disordered phase. You can actually prove mathematically that this phase transition is such that there is no local operator in the QFT, which is symmetric under SO3 times Z4, and deforming by it, you get a disordered phase. You can prove it. So this kind of transitions lead to interesting CFTs, which have various discrete anomalies, and they cannot be of this sort. They have to be fundamentally different. With why this choice, there's some motivation for SO3? You're asking why this choice? Uh, you could ask if there is a simpler example. In fact, there are examples which are like SO2 times SO2. There are also examples like this, where on one side you have this SO2 broken, on the other side you have that SO2 broken, and there is no phase where both of them are restored. So there are several examples. This is, uh, this is the simplest example. Maybe. It's a matter of taste. But there are many examples. Uh, but for example, there is no example with SO2. That's interesting. There cannot be an example with just SO2. You can prove that. Okay. Uh, order parameter always means some local operator. Yeah, some local operator, which in this case would be here. Let's say if you were a ginzburg landau physicist, a standard statistical physicist, you would say, okay, SO2 times SO2. I'll introduce two order parameters, x and y. This transforms under this SO2. This transforms under the other SO2. And I'll just write the most generic symmetric Lagrangian. So you'll have like x squared, y squared, you know, x squared. These kind of terms, all the possible SO2 invariant terms. This can never describe this transition because this kind of Lagrangians would always have a deformation like this and you can add a huge coefficient and the ground state would always be vanishing x, vanishing y, restored SO2 times SO2, okay? And you can prove that in this class of transitions that I'll build, there is no such phase. There cannot be such a phase. Okay, so these are models which are fundamentally beyond this idea of fluctuating order parameters, and they lead to interesting CFTs, which are especially interesting for bootstrap. Because they actually, you know, they, people argue that they might appear in nature, and we know that they appear in various applications for high energy physics. So they're extremely interesting for both HEPTH and uh, condensed matter physics. Oh yeah, it's much simpler. Yeah, uh, in this case, what, what they are approximating? We're approximating the physics near this point. Yeah, but uh, it's like uh, you have one quantum field theory, other field theory, the another theory, maybe it's more complicated. So if you were, okay. You're asking if I can, you're, I, I, I'm trying to understand what you're asking. You're asking if there is a QFT that describes this region? No, uh, it, there is some, some uh, original model you want to study. Ah. Yeah, there is a microscopic model, which is a spin model. I'll describe it in a second. And it's argued to have these phases. And then you will know that near this point, since there are long correlations, right, large correlations between excitations that are widely separated in space, you want to describe it with a continuum QFT. But we can prove that this continuum QFT cannot be a QFT for other parameters, okay? So I'll start by the lattice description, which is very cute. And then I'll switch to the QFT, continuum QFT description. Yeah. 
and you, I'll give you an argument both in continuum QFT and on the lattice that it cannot be described with order parameters, this phase transition, with fluctuating order parameters. So I'll, there will be many pictures. Uh, so this is a two-dimensional lattice, and there is also time. So now we're descri describing quantum systems. So this is just the Hamiltonian of some quantum system. It's a spin chain. Not a chain, it's a spin, it's a lattice of spins. And we sum over nearest neighbors. And at each point, there is a quantum spin. Not a classical spin, quantum spin. A quantum spin is a Pauli matrix. So we just do this. And we put the positive coefficient here. So there is no minus sign, this is important. Here there was a minus sign, so the spins wanted to be parallel, but now I'm not putting a minus sign. So this is a quantum anti-ferromagnet. That's how it's called, it's a mouseful. Quantum anti-ferromagnet. So should I decode what this means? S is just uh, S. It's just a SX. I'll do it in another way. S is a vector. S is a vector which has three, compo which has three components. These are not components in space. These are components in some, I mean, these are not components on the lattice. This, each spin is pointing in three, there is a three dimensional space of uh, directions in which it can point. So S is this, and the index I is like here. I is just the index which labels lattice sites. So I is on the lattice. S is this, uh, and it's defined to be in the usual Pauli algebra. They, they, def they are defined to obey the usual Pauli algebra. So at each, at each lattice site, there is uh, a spin up and down, a two-dimensional Hilbert space. So this you know, does the usual, uh, the usual Pauli algebra. I won't write all the equations. You can figure it out on your own. I'll just write uh, four. Uh, for S, Y, you can figure it out on your own. Okay, these are just quantum operators. And when we dot, we just take a standard SO3 scalar product. <coughs> Is the notation clear? Anybody wants to ask about the notation? If you miss, if you can't under, I mean, if you don't follow that, then it will be kind of hard to continue. So I just want to be 100% sure that everybody understands what this notation means. So what are the symmetries? First of all, what are the local operators? We're anticipating some quantum field theory. So let's uh, just discuss what are the local operators in this lattice construction. Well, these are the spins, right? The spins are nice Hermitian local operators. So we can take SI, we can take SJ. We don't have to form, we can take, a, you know, we can take a, a product with a, which symmetrizes uh, the indices, or we can take a product which is the scalar product, and we can do it for any i and j. We, just for, we can form more complicated operators, we can square this, blah, blah, blah. So there are lots of local operators that act on this huge Hilbert space. The Hilbert space of the system is, uh, there is a two-dimensional Hilbert space at every lattice site, so it's just a uh, two, there, there is a two-dimensional Hilbert space here, two-dimensional Hilbert space here, so it's two to the power of the lattice site of the lattice size. Yeah. So there are lots of local operators, and they transform under SO3. So this is the symmetry of the system, right? SO3 acts on these local operators. SU2 doesn't act faithfully. So it's extremely important to realize that the symmetry is SO3 and not SU2. SU2 does not act faithfully because the center of SU2 never acts on the spin operators. They transform under SO3. There are no operators that transform in the two-dimensional representation of SU2, only in uh, odd dimensional representations of SO3. 
of SU2. So SO3 is the actual symmetry, the taxon local operator. So if you are a bootstrap person, this system has SO3 symmetry, not SU2. And there are lattice symmetries. This lattice has uh, several symmetries. Notably, there is a translation symmetry because we've just summed over all the possible nearest neighbors. And there is also the 90 degrees rotation symmetry, right? It's, so the lattice symmetries are essentially uh, 90 degrees rotation and translation, which I'm just writing in this way. This has to do with this Z4 that will appear soon. Yeah. Uh, what you know, what we call local in when we pass to the continuum eventually, what becomes the local operator is any, you know, say bunch product of spins that are in some region. Yeah, I mean, you just coarse grain, and you can take for nearest neighbors, next to nearest neighbors. As long as it's not an infinite thing, it's going to become a local operator in the continuum. So the space of local operators in the continuum is uh, some horrible mess, which transforms under SO3. Okay, so these are the symmetries. Now, what are the phases? The phases. So, first of all, before we discuss the phases, which is the most interesting part of this uh, story, I, I just wrote the first few terms here, right? I just wrote the first term. But there are many other terms I could have written which preserved SO3 and lattice symmetries. So when we write this kind of Hamiltonians, especially in the condensed matter, if you read condensed matter papers, they never mean that, literally. They mean that you also add higher dimensional interactions involving, let's say, four spins, six spins, eight spins. They're usually truncated so that it would not become non-local. But they, you, can imagine, you imagine that you add more interactions which have the same symmetries. So they preserve SL3 time lattice. The symmetries are the key here because it's all about which symmetries are broken, which phases exist. So you should always imagine that we had more operators that preserve all the symmetries. And we'll discuss a I'll discuss a specific implementation. So don't take this literally. I'll discuss a specific Hamiltonian that exhibits what I'm going to say. So there is one phase which is called uh, the nail phase. Nail phase. Uh, and uh, the nail phase is the idea that you know, sometimes these Hamiltonians could have a phase that looks like this. Up, down, up, down, up, down, like this. A typical classical anti-ferromagnetic picture. So the ground state is like a direct product of up, down, up, down. There is no entanglement. So it's like the wave function of the ground state is like, a, you know, a direct product of up, down, ta -ta 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 -ta, over all this no interesting entanglement. And you have to choose a direction. These spins were three-dimensional spins, so you have to choose a direction. Let's say Z. So this phase breaks SO3 to SO2, because you have to choose a direction. Right? So this phase has sound modes. It has Goldstone modes, sound modes. And these Goldstone modes are in SO3 uh, divided by SO2 which is a, what? CP1, which is a sphere. So this is called the CP1 phase or the nail phase. Okay. So this is a phase where there are massless excitations. Uh, they look like Goldstone modes. The wave function is just up, down, up, down, up, down. And the symmetries are broken in this way. Now there is a question, what about the lattice symmetries? This is a very interesting question. So I would like to pose this question to the audience. What, are the la what happens to the lattice symmetries in the nail phase? Any ideas? Yeah, so the, naively it seems the translation symmetry is broken. But it's not. It's not. Translation symmetry is not broken, even translations by one side. Why? Because you've already broken SO3. So you can redefine translations by being translations accompanied with 180 degrees rotation inside the internal space. 
So the lattice symmetries are intact. It's a very non important non-trivial point. So the lattice symmetries are intact. Even though they seem to be broken, it's always the case. When you have a product of two symmetries, like lattice times SO3, if this is broken, you have to be careful when you discuss those. Because you could redefine them to be accompanied by some broken rotations here. And they could be preserved. So the lattice symmetries are intact. OK, this is the nail phase, which is one possible ground state in this quantum anti-ferromagnet. And now there is the next phase. I mean, here we're not doing any computation. We're just guessing which phases could be. This looks like a good thing, because this is how you would minimize the classical Hamiltonian, which is an anti-ferromagnet. So it looks good. But, quantum, but then there is a phase which is genuinely quantum mechanical. And that's why, I mean, you cannot have such things in classical systems. This phase is called the valence bond state, the valence bond solid state. It's a weird name. Uh, I'm not going to use it. I'm going to call it the, the Polyakov, the Polyakov phase, because Polyakov discovered it 20 years before in, in, in the continuum language. Uh, it's sometimes abbreviated as VBS. But you'll see that it's essentially what Polyakov did 20 years before. It's the same thing. So if you think about this phase as a quantum anti-ferromagnet, then it looks like this. I'm just going to draw circles and then explain what they mean. So what a circle means, what this means is that these spins are entangled. So if we have two spins and we have a circle, what it means is that it's up, down, minus a down, up, and we have to divide by square root of 2 for the good taste. Okay, That's a very amusing phase. It also looks like it's very low energy, very low energy. I mean, it's not, none of these phases is an exact ground state for this Hamiltonian. You have to do a little bit, you have to add stuff. But it looks like it could minimize the energy of quantum antiferromagnets. Why? Because the total spin here vanishes, right? This is in a singlet of the total spin. So it means that it minimizes some scalar products. OK? It minimizes some scalar products. Because, I mean, this is the singlet representation of the spin, of the total spin. But this is not unique. Uh, there are four versions. So this, I'm going to, so first of all, what about SO3? Let's do one by one. What about SO3 in this phase? What about global SO3? It's OK because it's in a singlet, right? So SO3 is OK because it's a singlet representation. What about lattice? Now lattice symmetries are broken. Because if you look at it like the other way, it looks different. And also if you translate by one lattice site, it looks different. So. So I want to draw the same lattice. Like I had one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four. So I have four here. And then six here. One, two, three, four, five, six. So another way to pair up the spins could have been that. So this corresponds to acting on this state with the translation by one lattice unit. And then there will be something here, something here. Okay, so this is obtained from this by translating by one lattice unit. And also there is the corresponding thing that you get if you flip your head. So it would, I'm not just like this, okay. And then translating by one lattice unit. So there are four ground states. Okay. It's often useful to visualize them as like this one, this one, this one, and this one. So they correspond to Z4 that's broken to nothing. And this Z4 is made out of translations and rotations of the lattice. A, a homework exercise for you is that you have to prove that this is Z4 and not Z2 times Z2. It's a fun exercise. It's really fun. To prove that these four ground states are in the representation of Z4 and not Z2 times Z2. So try to do it. So we have four ground states. All of them preserve SO3, but they're related to each other by these uh, translations and 90 degrees rotations of the lattice. 
uh, there are no ground states of anything yet. I, I'm just saying, if you just think about phases of quantum and antiferromagnets, these are two natural phases. Okay. It's not a ground state of anything. It's not even an eigenstate. And also, this is not an eigenstate. Definitely not of this. But if you just think which states could minimize, this is more or less a good starting point. Yeah. Sorry, very main question. If instead of selecting these pairings, I shifted one in every two rows, one step to the right. Say again? If instead of doing these pairings, okay. in, in one of every two rows, I shifted the pairing one step to the right. So you want, let's say here, like this? Let's say in the even rows you'll be doing like this, and in the odd rows you'll be doing like this. Say again. Do I get something equivalent? Equivalent? No, no, no. This would uh, cost uh, infinite. This would, this would, these two phases. Uh, so you could ask a simpler question: What happens if you have this phase, and then you, then you know, starting from some point, you have the other one? You you will see in, yeah. as as we go on that there is a domain wall here, yeah, yeah. and it has infinite energy. So it doesn't minimize the energy. So there is a question of which precise Hamiltonians are we discussing? So just to clear this question out of the way, because it's good. Say again. There are also these phases, these phases where you sum over all possible dimers, right? Yes. The, would you add them as well to the list of possible phases? I, I, I'm not going to discuss that one. I'm going to discuss a Hamiltonian, which has a, these two states. But we can, I can tell you about the other phase and how it's described in the continuum. And I'm just not going to discuss it. It's a little bit complicated. It's a little bit more comp advanced or more complicated. So let me just uh, clear the question of what Hamiltonian are we discussing. So I'll just tell you which Hamiltonian. And then I'll prove to you that, cannot, that this transition cannot be described by ginzburg landau And this is an extremely beautiful argument. Uh, very rare. I mean, it's an extremely complicated question, and there is a one-line solution. It's extremely beautiful. So let me first tell you which Hamiltonian we're discussing. So the first term is what I wrote. So we just take a scalar product of nearest neighbors. And then we add another term, which preserves SO3 times lattice, trans lattice symmetries. And uh, I'll explain what this notation means. I, J, K, L. And then we do S, I, S, J, minus a quarter times S, K, S, L, minus a quarter. And we dot. Now, what this th does this no notation mean? So we have some lattice. And this just corresponds to the term that we've already discussed. Q is positive. Uh, and this term <coughs> is a sum over parallel pairs. So these, for example, or uh, I'll just use a different color. So we sum over parallel links on the same plaquette. And we take the product of SI. So IJ are like this and this. And then K and L are this and this. Or I and J are this and this. And then K and L are this and this. This term intuitively forces you to go to these entangled states. Okay? That's what it does intuitively. It forces you to pick this uh, pattern where this also answers uh, uh, Janice's question. This particular Hamiltonian doesn't want to be in that state you, you want it because it has this, you know, this specific prescription for, how the, for which interactions you've added. Now, this Hamiltonian has been simulated on the lattice. And what people have found, this is a correct result, is that when qj is smaller than something, there is a transition. We don't yet know if the transition is second order or, for, or very weakly, very, very, very weakly first order. But we know that when this is smaller than some critical number, you're in the nail phase. And if it's large, then this, other, then this same number, it's the same number here, 
then you're in the VBS phase or the Polyakov phase. It's a correct result. We just don't know if the transition is first or second order. The, the exponents haven't converged very much yet. Say again? No, because it's a discrete symmetry. So instead of uh, Goldstone bosons, you have a domain wall. Because you have like, you should imagine that there is a huge configuration space and you have four minima. And they're connected by some domain walls. Now there is a beautiful proof. It's an absolutely uh, gorgeous argument. Which shows uh, that this transition cannot be a Lando Ginsburg transition. So let me just. Uh, yeah, I was worried about raising the mass. So, so we have this axis of Q over J. Here we have uh, Z. Here we have four ground states. This is where, sorry. Here we have uh, CPS2. Here we have uh, sound modes, Goldstone bosons, corresponding to an S2 sigma model. Then there is a transition at some specific Q over J, which is the critical Q over J. And here we have four ground states. Okay, so this is the picture. And well, we don't yet know exactly if this transition is first or second order. And now, the argument that why this cannot be Landau Ginsburg. This is the most interesting part of this lecture. We'll, I'll, I'll then switch to the continuum description of this conformal of this of this model, and you'll see that I, we can reproduce this argument in the continuum. And uh, this is, I think, this is the crux of the matter. So let me try to draw it. I'll need a lot, I'll need some space. It's a pictorial argument of why it cannot be uh, a Landau Ginsburg description. So I need four lines like this. One. Two, three, four, one, two, and then six lines like this. One, two, three, four, five, six. So now I'll start drawing. Uh, maybe I'll use a few colors. So the argument is here, I should say, that the argument that this transition cannot be Ginsburg-Landau is done in this phase. You could also devise an argument in this phase. I could explain to you maybe after the lecture or in the Samba bar uh, how, to do, how to do an argument in the nail phase. But the argument that I'm going to do now is in the VBS phase. So the idea is that you study the VBS phase, you, do, you study the VBS phase very carefully, and then you find something that can never exist in a broken, spontaneously broken phase of a Ginsburg-Landau-Lagrangian. That's the idea. And what this something is, is uh, will become clear soon. So we try to make these four ground states uh, be near each other. So you see what, what, I'm trying, what I'm trying to do? I'm trying to make these phases coexist. All the four phases. So maybe I'll use one last color, if there is one. All right, it's the same. So I'll just use this. Okay, so it's a clockwork business. Notice that these guys are shifted from these guys by one lattice unit. Okay, so these are the four ground states that we had. This is shifted from this by one lattice unit, and this is shifted from this by one lattice unit. So it's like we've created in the continuum, you could think about it as two domain walls. So here is vacuum number one, 
vacuum number two, vacuum number three, vacuum number four. And they're all related to each other by this 90 degree, by this Z4 symmetry of the lattice. So it's like an intersection. You can think about it as an intersection of two domain walls. Okay? The special thing is that if you draw it on the lattice, it becomes clear that no matter how you do it, there is a guy here that is left untouched. Okay? There is a leftover spin that's sitting there, not part of anything. It's the intersection of the domain walls. What is this guy? This guy is a spin half particle. So when we have two domain walls and they intersect, there is a spin half particle that is trapped here. We have a trapped spin half particle. Okay, this, this can never happen in Ginzburg Landau for the following reason. The symmetry of the model was SO3 times Z4. We're in this phase where there are four ground states broken and Z4 is broken. However, the intersection of the domain walls has a particle which is not in an SO3 representation. So it's an SU2. The intersection has an SU2 particle, SU2, a particle in an SU2 representation, which is not an SO3 representation. So it's a central extension. We have Z2 going to SU2 going to SO3. So the symmetry of the landau ginzburg machinery, the order parameter was an SO3 order parameter. Then we had another Z4 order parameter. We do an intersection of two domain walls and we find an SU2 representation which is not an SO3 representation. That cannot be. There are no central extensions in landau ginzburg theories. They are trivial. This is the same as what I talked about in the colloquium. This is a Tooft anomaly. A discrete a Tooft anomaly. So it's the same type of thing. So this particular model, whatever it is in the continuum, cannot be described by competing order parameters. Uh, because when you construct two domain walls, there is something sitting at the vortex, and there is no such thing in scalar field theories. In scalar field theories, all the domain walls are trivial, all the intersections are trivial, and definitely there are no projective representations. So this cannot happen in scalar field theories, in L of some, you know, phi i's. It just cannot happen. And that's, that's the argument. Ah, fantastic, fantastic. You could, here I insisted on doing this clockwork, clockwork business, right? So, so right, just for the recording, if you could repeat the question. Ah, the, the question is, what happens if I construct a domain wall between two phases and I don't insist on doing the clockwork? Is that the question? Yes. So we could construct on the lattice the analog of one, two. It's very easy. It's like, you know, just take this picture and keep copying it. Don't, don't have this complicated structure. The domain wall is trivial. So if you just did that, the domain wall would be trivial. There are no excitations trapped on the domain wall. There is no central extension. It's, it's trivial. It's only the intersection of two that has this spin a half guy, uh, shout, you know, trapped in the middle. Yes, but in this case, we cannot describe using a No, this, I mean, this, if you just studied this question, you would find no obstruction. But once you find one obstruction, it's enough. You don't need to find an obstruction in every question that you ask. It's enough to find one question where there is an obstruction. And this is enough. Domain walls of scalar filters cannot have spin a half particles trapped. There isn't even a spin a half particle in the Lagrangian. Where would it come from? Say again. Yes. S is Hermitian. You know, Pauli matrices are Hermitian, so it's Hermitian. But they commute. Pauli matrices at different sites commute. Uh -huh. So S is Hermitian, so everything is Hermitian. OK, this is a very cute proof. This proof is from 2005. It's by Levin and Sentil. I think it's uh, 2005. I think this, this is the first case in which, now from the continuum point of view, you will see that this is sort of 
we can understand that using Polyakov's mechanism. So they discovered something really fantastic on the lattice, but in terms of the continuum, it's not, it's not different from things that we've already seen. But it's a model that cannot be uh, described in terms of ginsburg landau the ginsburg landau language. Okay, so this is uh, what I wanted to say about the lattice. And now I'm going to describe the continuum version of this business. Okay, okay. can I, is it okay? This is the end of the lattice discussion. And now we're going to discuss how we are thinking about the CFT or the transition. How do we do this thing in the continuum? Okay. Well, but this is the Hamiltonian, right? I wrote the Hamiltonian. You are asking if I. Say again. What is the other phase? I just don't follow. Yeah, as in, in the Neo phase. Yes. And then I start playing with the FT over J ratio. But that's what the, it's written here in yellow, right? Oh, but could it be that you could never realize this possible domain? During the phase oh, I don't need to realize it during the phase transition. This is something that you can see deep in the VBS phase. You sit in the VBS phase and you just construct these domain walls. Is it clear or not so much? I, I guess I missed the logic of the proof, but I can Okay, no, that, that's important. The logic of the proof is important. So deep in the VBS phase, the Hamiltonian has four ground states, okay? And these four ground states are uh, of a Hamiltonian that exists, let's say, ideally, ideally speaking, on an infinite lattice. So you can force, by choosing appropriate boundary conditions, on this quadrant, the ground state would be one, two, three and four. You just choose the boundary conditions on this huge lattice such that you force the system to be in different ground states in the different four quadrants. And then you run the um, simulation. Then you run the simulation, right? And the system would obviously create domain walls because it cannot do anything else. It wants to minimize the energy. What's the best way to minimize the energy given such boundary conditions is to have domain walls. It's not gonna prefer to be in some completely other different state because a different state would cost you volume-like energy, not a perimeter-like energy. So the best way is to have a perimeter. And this perimeter is like a domain wall. But if you try to actually draw it, which is what this gentleman did, you find that there is always a guy that is stuck. There is always a guy that is stuck here. And so the intersection will always have a spin a half particle. Everything else is gapped. This is gap, 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 but there is a spin a half particle here, so there is a qubit. If you want to say something precise, mathematically, then you would say the following. We force the system to be in this state by choosing different boundary conditions in the four quadrants, and what we find is that the full Hamiltonian has a twofold degeneracy. Twofold, even though the representation, the symmetry is SL3 times Z4, the degeneracy is twofold, and it's a doublet of SL3, so to speak. More precisely, it's a doublet of SU2. So you find that there is up or down. In the intersection, you can do up or down. So there is a twofold degeneracy. Okay, that's what you find mathematically. Is this central intention related to the fact that there's no disorder space? Yeah. So that's exactly the logic that I yeah, explained in the, in the previous, in the, in the colloquium. I'm going to use that observation to prove using continuum method, this system cannot have disordered phases. So every model that has this kind of domain will also have no disordered phase? Yes. As long as you only add operators that preserve the symmetries. If you start adding operators that break SO3 to uh, you know, SO2, or you break the Z4, you could destroy the order. So we say that this order, this, we say that this system is always ordered, and the order is non-trivial, it cannot be destroyed. It's like, you know, somebody, it's like this qubit in the colloquium. You, you cannot destroy it by adding interactions as long as the interactions do not break the symmetries. Okay, so this order is very, very persistent. What if you added uh, explicit SU0? Well, but then the symmetry would not be, I mean, you added new operators. S is an SO3 operator. You could add, like, you could add more stuff which breaks the symmetry then there is no anomaly. 
and then you, you might have a disordered phase somewhere in parameter space. There won't be any obstruction. The point here is that there is, as long as the symmetries are preserved, there is an obstruction, a mathematical obstruction to a disordered phase. If you compactify the space, then what? Well, if you compactify the space, then it's quantum mechanics with the symmetry which looks like SO, SU2 times S. If you compactify the space, roughly speaking, you have to sum over all the ground states, the nail ground states, the Z4 ground states, but still the Hamiltonian would have a degenerate ground state because there is a central extension. If you have a central extension, there is no singlet representation. So even if you compactify the model, I mean, these pictures wouldn't quite make sense because to create these domain walls, I impose some boundary conditions at infinity, but you'll have something else. This Hamiltonian could not have a trivial ground state, even on a compact lattice. So now, I mean, since this is a bootstrap conference, I would like to describe the continuum version of this model. I'll be rather fast now. Uh, maybe I'll be slow and then I'll do it in the next lecture. I don't know what's better to describe. Be slow and do it in the next lecture. OK, so I'll be slow. Uh, so my, the point is that I want to describe the continuum field theory that reproduces everything we said, OK? Uh, everything, including this vortex, the domain world, blah, blah, blah. And to properly do it, I would need a little bit of time. And uh, it can actually be useful for, I think. One of the outstanding challenges for the bootstrap program is to decide if this transition is first or second order. It can be done with bootstrap methods. So what I want to explain is what exactly is the question and how you could solve it using bootstrap methods. That's my end goal, so I, I'll, I'll be slow. First, I want to talk about a subject that looks at first sight completely un, unrelated. It's a small digression. Maybe, maybe many of you have seen it in grad school, but maybe some did not. Uh, the relation to that story would not be apparent until much later. I want to discuss a free photon in, a in two plus one dimensions. Just Maxwell. Maxwell's theory in two plus one dimensions. A is a U1 gauge field. So uh, in two plus one dimensions, the photon can have only one. So the polarization is always orthogonal to the direction of motion. And since we're in two space dimensions, there is only uh, one polarization. So if the photon goes in this way, it can be polarized only in this plane, only in this line. It cannot be polarized in any other way. So there is one degree of freedom. So this system has one degree of freedom. And uh, <coughs> for this reason, it makes sense that this model is actually the same as a free scalar. So there is a, let me just, so let's do it precisely. The idea is that you can change variables and think about a photon in two plus one dimensions as a free compact scalar. And the change of variables is as follows. So rho, mu, nu, <coughs> d mu, a nu equals d rho of some phi. Phi is a scalar. So you can convert a photon into a scalar because they have the same number of degrees of freedom. The only thing that is important for me now is that phi is actually a periodic scalar. That would be very important for our discussion. Now, a homework exercise. Is, so you have already two exercises. One is to show that it's z4 and not z2 times z2. And the second exercise is to fix the coefficient in this dictionary such that phi is in d2 pi periodic. Fix coefficients. What's the idea? The idea is that uh, gauge, the gauge field can have magnetic flux. So suppose you have a torus. The gauge field can have a magnetic flux. 
which is normalized in this way. It's 2 pi times an integer. So uh, the scalar, to reproduce that kind of configuration using this map, you need to allow the scalar to do some 2 pi jump. So you need to fix the coefficient such that if the scalar undergoes a 2 pi jump, you get the same flux. Okay, so this is a small exercise. So a scalar and a free gauge field are the same. Are there any questions about that? Now, the, after di doing this change of variables, the action becomes this 3x e squared over 2 del phi squared. So it's a free scalar. A free photon is the same as a free scalar. Now, the symmetries are going to be very important, the symmetries of this, uh, <coughs> the symmetries of this model. So the free photon has a conserved current in two plus one dimensions, which is J mu equals epsilon mu mu rho d nu a rho. This is a conserved current by Bianchi's identity. Because d rho, d, if you hit it with d mu, it obviously vanishes. So this is a conserved current, and it gives rise to what we call U1 topological charge, U1t. So this is a U1 symmetry that is present in the theory of a free photon in two plus one dimensions. In terms of the scalar, it's really easy to describe. In terms of the scalar, it's just d mu of phi. And you see that it's conserved by using the equations of motion. If you hit it, if you hit this current with d mu, you use the equations of motion and you get zero because of the Klein-Gordon equation, okay? So this is a U1, so the system of a free compact scalar or a free photon has a U1 symmetry, which is called U1 topological, YT. Why is it called topological? Because the integrals, if you want to construct the charge, the charge is obtained by integrating this current over some two-dimensional space. So the charge is just the integral of dA. And this is also mathematically known as the Chern class, first Chern class of the U1 gauge field, so it has to do with topology. But it's just a, you know, it's just a conserved current. It's just a conserved current. It has an interesting interpretation in terms of topology, but it's not a big deal. Now, I don't want to erase this beautiful picture. So now I would like to discuss the question, which operators are actually charged under this uh, symmetry? So if you go back to the theory of a free photon, this is the current. And this current is conserved topologically, meaning that if you just hit it with d mu, it's conserved for obvious reasons, for stupid reasons. So actually, operators that you can construct out of the photon, like d mu, a nu, minus d nu, a mu, to any power, these kind of operators do not carry this charge. They are neutral under this U1. They are scalar, they're, sorry, they are neutral operators. They don't carry any charge. But this theory of a free photon has more abstract operators, which are called monopole operators. And they have an index N. And they have charge N under U1 topological. So they have charge N under U1 topological. The advantage of the language of the scalar is that it's really easy to describe these operators. It's a little bit hard to describe their construction in terms of the gauge field, but it's really easy to describe them in terms of the scalar field. So they are just given by e to the i phi n. They're just exponentials, cosines and sines. This makes sense because if n is an integer and phi is 2 pi periodic, it's okay. So this is uh, the same. So I'm not going to describe them in terms of the gauge field. It's not important. But they exist. And they are lo good local operators. So if you're a bootstrap person, they're part of your local operators. But they're a little bit easier to describe in terms of the scalar field phi, because they're just exponentials. That's one comment. Any questions about this? I assume many of you know that already, so. Another thing is that the scalar system has a symmetry where phi goes to minus itself. We might call it charge conjugation. This maps to the symmetry A going to minus A. 
So this is charge conjugation, and this is just a reflection symmetry of the scalar field. So these two symmetries are the same under this duality. So you can think about it as a you know, silly example of duality, where a gauge field and the scalar are the same. OK, so this, was just the, this is the end of the digression. I'll take five more minutes, <coughs> and I'll continue from where I stopped. So this is, this is the end of the first digression. And now I'm going to tell you about the second digression. The second digression is about the O2 model that you might have already heard about. This is, again, in a 2 plus 1. I'm always in 2 plus 1 for these lectures. This is the O2 model. This model has well-known phases. If this is m squared, if m squared is huge and positive, the O2 symmetry is unbroken. And we have a single ground state, a single ground state. So this, is, this system is boring because it's in the Ginzburg-Landau framework. It has a disordered state. And then if m squared is negative, uh, this phi obtains an expectation value. And uh, we have an S1 worth of vacua. So S1 uh, Goldstone boson, number Goldstone boson. And here there is a fixed point, right? The O2 fixed point. So we know that this transition is second order. This is, these are well-known facts to you, right? Now I'm going to quote a result. I'm just going to quote a result, which would be very important for our development of this uh, story, which is due to Peskin, Dasgupta, and Halperin from the 80s. So this is the deep fundamental result due to Peskin, Dasgupta, not together. These were independent papers. And Halperin. This is one rare example of an exact result about interacting quantum filters, which is proven. This result is true. It's proven. It's not a speculation. The point, they're, they're claiming that this model is exactly the same as the model where you are of a charged scalar field. So we have d mu minus a mu phi squared plus m squared phi squared plus phi to the 4 plus a kinetic term. So they're claiming that these models are exactly the same. They're dual to each other. So I have to develop the map. This is an extremely non-obvious non claim. I want to spend three minutes telling you about the map, and I'll review it tomorrow, the map. So first, let's discuss the phases. Just let's see that the phase diagram is the same. If m squared is huge and positive in this model, what do we do? We integrate it out, right? What do we remain with at low energies? Somebody in the audience to see if, ever, if somebody's still following. What do we remain with if we integrate out the scalar field? We're, we have a photon. What is a photon dual to? A compact scalar. A compact scalar is an S1, right? So here we have an S1. And the U1 topological symmetry is broken to nothing, to nothing. So I should have started by saying what are the symmetries. Let's see that the symmetries agree. The symmetry of this model is just U1, SO2, right? Or more precisely, O2, because there is also charge conjugation. This is the symmetry of this model, where you just rotate phi by a phase. Here, rotating phi by a phase is not a symmetry. Why? Because it's gauged. This particle is charged with charge 1 under the photon. So this is not a symmetry. <laughs> However, there is a U1 symmetry that is just our J, uh, mu, which is epsilon mu nu rho, d nu a rho. OK? So you, we have U1 topological. So the symmetries are the same. And we have charge conjugation. So in fact, we have O2. So the symmetry is O2 here, and it's O2 there. There is charge conjugation and topological symmetry. And here we have a rotation symmetry plus inversion of phi going to minus phi and involution. So the symmetries are the same. 
But here at huge mass squared, we have an S1. So it's like reversed, right? What happens if m squared is very, very negative? This is the abelian Higgs model. So phi is condensed. What remains at low energies? Nothing. The photon is heavy. Phi is gone. It's like a Higgs particle. So it's a disordered phase. And U1t is uh, preserved. So we see that the phase diagram is, is the same if we map uh, phi squared in the xy model or the O2 model to minus phi squared of the dasgupta peskin halperin model, PDH. So there is an important minus sign in the duality. So we established the first entry in the duality. Positive mass here is the same as negative mass here. Here, this, this system has interesting order parameters. For example, phi is an order parameter. What is the order parameter here? Well, we look at the quantum numbers. Phi transforms under SO2 with charge 1. So here, it's the monopole operator, M1. So M1 is the same as phi. Say again. Yeah, so let's take m squared to be huge and negative. What does phi do? It's like in the standard model. It condenses. And then the gauge field picks up a mass. And the radial mode of phi disappears, because it's like the Higgs field. So the, ener the low energy theory is empty. That's what we call a disordered phase. OK? Is it OK? So the order parameter here is m1. That's the mon monopole operator which you can think about as e to the i phi in terms of the dual scalar of Polyakov, the duality between the scalar and the gauge field. It's Polyakov's duality. And here it's phi. So this is another entry in the map. So this is a correct correspondence. And I'm going to use it in the next lecture to try to somehow, elab let, let's say, to address it with a little bit more structure so that it will be powerful enough to describe our nail VBS transition. So what I'm going to do next is to start from this, start from this duality. I want you to think about this duality tonight. Check that you understand all the dictionary elements. Check that you understand what are monopole operators, what are phi's, how everything maps to everything nicely. And then I'm going to elaborate on that, add more structure, and so that we'll kill this disordered phase. Essentially, what's bad about it is that this has disordered phase, this is a disordered phase, these are boring models. So I'm going to do, uh, add more structure to, this, to, 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 make, to get rid of it. So that on one side, we'll have an S1. And on the other side, we'll have an S2. And then we're very close to nail VBS. So this is your homework. Just think about it. Understand? <laughs> there are two exercises that I gave you that are concrete. Plus, you have to just sit and make sure that you understand all the elements in the dictionary. Yeah, so, yeah, that's okay. I'll just say two things. One is that there is a transition here. And if this duality is true, it should better be exactly the same, all two, will, all two fixed point, with the same exact critical exponents, anomalous dimensions that you know, we, are, we are familiar with from the O2 model. So how do we prove this duality? You put it on the computer, you go to the fixed point, and you check that you get the same critical exponents. So this is the O2 fixed point. Conjecture. Now about your question. The, there is an S1 here. So there is some U1 topological is broken. So there is an order parameter in this Lagrangian that gets a VEV. Like here, there is an order parameter that gets a VEV, which is fine. So what is this order parameter? This order parameter is the monopole operator. But it's hard to describe. So instead, we imagine that we're deep in this S1 phase. And then we approximately have a system which just has one free photon. That's the approximation. And then we can do this duality. 
that I explained there between a scalar and a photon. So this is in quotation marks. This is not something that we can do in the fundamental theory because this is not just a free photon. This is a free photon plus lots of garbage. But once we are here in the semi-classical regime where m squared is huge, we can do this duality in the infrared. And it's convenient to think about the order parameter as the scalar field of Polyakov. And that's what gets the VEV. Okay, so phi is just a coordinate on this S1. It, this, and M1 gets a VEV. So M1 is non-zero. We sometimes can think about this phase as a condensation of monopoles. Why do we think about it as a condensation of monopoles? Because M1 has a VEV. And it breaks the topological symmetry spontaneously. This is also known as the Polyakov phase. Any more questions before problem solving?